Hi, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Joyful Friar podcast. I'm Father Nathan, and today I have with me Mark Anthony. Mark Anthony, JD, the psychic explorer, also known as the psychic lawyer, is a fourth generation psychic medium who communicates with spirits. He's Oxford educated attorney, licensed to practice law in Florida, Washington, D.C., and before the United States Supreme Court. This psychic explorer travels to mystical locations and remote corners of the world to examine ancient mysteries and supernatural phenomena. Mark appears nationwide on TV and radio, including CBS TV's The Doctors and Gaia TV's Beyond Belief with George Nury. He's the co-host of the live stream shows The Psychic and the Doc on the Transformation Network. He is a featured speaker at conferences, expos, and universities, including Brown, Columbia, Harvard, and Yale. Mark Anthony is a columnist for Best Holistic Life magazine. His latest bestseller, The Afterlife Frequency, is the gold winner of the COVR Visionary Awards, was up for a Pulitzer, and ranked by prettyprogressive.com as one of the top books about faith in God. And his other best-selling books are Never Letting Go, and evidence of eternity. So we welcome Mark Anthony. Great to have thank you. you. Thank you, Father Nathan. It's an honor to be here, and I really appreciate you having me on your podcast. Sure. Well, um, I'm grateful that you're uh, willing to be with a, a new podcaster, and I'm really honored that you would uh, grace us with your presence today. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, it's, it's great that you're doing this because um, Radio and and dissemination of information is changing, and podcasts are now replacing magazines and, and newspapers for people getting their information. So this is a, a really great way, and I really appreciate you bringing a very spiritual aspect in the positive sense to this as well. Well, great to have you here. You know, it's funny. I remember seeing an interview with Lucille Ball. Um, they showed it, um, I guess it's been like 70 years or something since I Love Lucy. And she was very old and uh, they were interviewing her and they said, well, did you have any idea what a prolific and incredible show it was? And she said, you know, we were too busy making it to think about that. Yeah, so yeah. so that, that's, that's um, you know, people like yourself and I, we're out here doing the spiritual work. You know, you're, you're working as a priest, as a shepherd of your flock, um, in using your spiritual God-given gift of interdimensional communication. I'm doing uh, my work as as a, uh, NDE researcher and a medium and paranormal expert. And so we're we're pretty busy guys. Absolutely. And I, I do my best to keep abreast of, of uh, the other podcasts and, and publications out there. But people need to realize that what we do is pretty much a 24-7 occupation. Well, I call mine a night job. You know, I, I'm a regular priest doing you know, stuff that priests do all the time, uh, saying masses, hearing confessions, uh, counseling. But a lot of it for me has ended up online, especially because of the pandemic. There, uh, I used to travel and do a lot of in-person events. And in the meanwhile, I had to learn how to be online, uh, even though I got through college on a typewriter. I, you know, <laughs> here I have... Now I have a podcast and all these Zoom shows and stuff. Can you well, you know, um, uh, before we get into my stuff, I have to say that when the when the uh, pandemic started, the Catholic Church was at the front of the innovation by all of a sudden switching uh, church services to Zoom. Yeah, and yeah. and being very careful about social distancing. You know, other other denominations uh, not so much. And a friend of mine who who was raised as an evangelical, um, and he said, well, why do you think that is? I said, come on, the Catholic Church has been around for 2,000 years. You think this is the first plague that we've ever dealt with? <laughs> I hadn't thought of it that way. <laughs> no, it's not our first plague. Uh, <laughs> but you're, you're right. Even little churches with small budgets were live streaming a mass. Um, and yeah. uh, somebody figured out how to do it, and now you know that skill. You know, I've had my own spiritual experiences all my life, as you have. Both of us came from families, people with psychic gifts in your grandparents' generation. Uh, both of my parents, uh, my mother, she was an extremely gifted psychic medium. And then her maternal grandmother, and they they emigrated from Italy. 
And it's interesting because my maternal grandmother, her name was Giovanna, and she was very well respected in the Catholic community of North New Jersey and um, New York City in Little Italy. And she was known as the woman who knows things. And huh. church officials used to go and meet with her. Um, and nuns that had arrived from Europe, usually from Italy, she would house them and help them make the adjustment into American society. Well, in 2016, PBS did a special called The Italian Americans, and they did an entire segment on Giovanna, and they even referenced her oh. psychic abilities. And it was really cool because, like, I knew that it was coming up. So, like, on every commercial break, my cousins and I were on the cell phone. Did you see that? You know, oh. and uh, they had an interview with um, my cousin Lori, who wrote about our family and actually showed some footage of Giovanna's daughter, my maternal grandmother, Angelina, talking about her life. And so in, in my mother's family, these gifts were, they were, they called them the, the gift of second sight, the gift of visions, and it was looked at as a gift of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, now, yeah. my father's family hailed from Pennsylvania, and they were very conservative Pennsylvanian Baptists. In fact, my great-great-grandfather, his name was Judson Curtis, on my dad's side of the family was a Baptist minister and founded a Baptist church. But my dad had four siblings, three sisters and a brother, and one of his siblings, Marjorie, she was a medium like my dad was, and then their mother, um, Isabel, and their maternal grandmother, Grace. But in their, they, they kind of lived like in this Pennsylvania version of Mayberry, so yeah. they had to keep it quiet. And my dad, you know, he used to hear voices and things, and, you know, he knew as a kid, you know, you don't say that. And he told me, one time he came in, he, you know, they, they had a lot of land and he had to work and he came home early on a Thursday. And on Thursdays, you weren't supposed to go into the parlor because his, his mother, um, Isabel and his, his, um, grandmother, Grace used to have the ladies over for tea. Well, he was listening through the door. No, they weren't drinking tea. <laughs> they were doing readings. All and, right. So dad said, you know, yeah, we, we had it too, but we kept it very quiet. So then my dad became a Navy SEAL. And then um, after the Navy met my mom and they, they said they had this connection. And after a couple of dates, you know, they met at a USO dance. It was very Americana. Yeah. And mom said to my dad, she goes, you know, there's something I have to tell you about me. And she was very nervous. She goes, well, I see spirits. He goes, oh, my God. And the sailor expletives coming out of his mouth. He said, I do, too. And then they realized that their meeting was more than just an attraction on, on the physical level. And, of course, my mother was a very good Italian Catholic girl. And, and you know, she, you know, she had to be chaperoned at these events. But they broke away to talk about this. And so when I was about three and a half, I started seeing spirits. And I remember mom going, oh, he's got it. And dad was like, oh, God, he's got it. <laughs> <laughs> Poor kid. <laughs> my sister uh, is is uh, one of my best friends, and she's helped me get my books done and everything. She she married six years ago. And w when she was, uh, you know, in the engagement or in talking about it, she she's related this story to me that she told my now brother-in-law now if you get involved with me here's the deal <laughs> yeah i got all this stuff going on and by the way so does my brother and my brother's a large part of my life and he would be uh along for the ride in our marriage just so you know so uh, and then my grandmother lived next door my dad's mother and she was this mystic that um she she did, took up oil painting and she used to say sweet jesus take my hand and let's go so she would like asked jesus to help her paint stuff uh, awesome. and, uh then she she rewired her house with the help of joseph the carpenter um, and built a, a bathroom in her garage so she wouldn't track mud in from her garden and stuff. so i grew up around this idea that the saints are just ready to help you you just have to make friends and and ask them to help you do stuff all right let me ask you this let's say somebody lost their car keys who did you ask for help well, yeah, I, I know about Tony, Tony Turnaround. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, right, for the non-Catholics, that's St. Anthony of, of Padua. 
Um, if you lose something, at, I remember I was in college and one of my fraternity brothers, he lost his keys and he was going crazy. He goes, Mark, you're Catholic. Pray to that. Who's that guy? St. Anthony. I go, St. Anthony helped Carl find his keys. He goes, is that it? Don't you have to ring a bell? And he puts his hand down on this newspaper and he goes, my keys are under the newspaper. And I go, all right, there you go. Ever. Well, the, <laughs> the rhyme that I was taught is Tony, Tony, turn around. Something's lost and must be found. So we always just said, St. Anthony, help us find, help us find the thing. And she tried to get me to be friends with St. Anthony, but I just thought, no, he's your friend. I'll, I'll figure my own way. But I have a whole gaggle of, of uh, St. Friends and, and, and souls, you know, my parents and the lots of people I love who have passed that are still uh, very uh, much a part of my life. You know, certainly. And, and isn't that reassuring? Yeah, and for me, it doesn't seem at all strange. It's it's what I was raised in, and then I'm a Dominican, and we're we're loaded. Saint Dominic founded the order, talking back and forth to Mary, Mother of Jesus. Uh, you know, it, it's so funny because so many people in, in of the Christian faith and of the Jewish faith too believe that this is somehow negative, and and there's quotes in Deuteronomy and Leviticus against it. But then when you look at Corinthians and Romans. You find verses that are in favor of spirit communication, but but what what all faiths teach us, Father Nathan, as you well know, is that the soul pre-exists the body. God creates the souls. Souls are infinite, immortal beings, come into this temporary container, the body, and when the body no longer functions, the soul moves on. Yeah. So if what we really are is a soul why should it be unusual that we can communicate with them? And, and of course, religions have their objectives, why they want to do, uh, why they want to proclaim this negative. Um, my perspective is, and, and, and several people in the mediumship community, and I mean, no disrespect to anybody at all, but there's this, our way is the only way. And you can only get to God through our clerics, our dogma. And by the way, you better give us 10% of your income. Otherwise, this isn't right. And that may work for some people. And if it does, that's fine. But for other people, they are very sensitive to the presence of spirits. I've had people telling me my whole life, you're demonic, you're evil, you're this, you're that. And then I've had thousands upon thousands of people thank me for facilitating communication between them and their loved ones in spirit and for the peace, the peace that it has brought them. So, you know, what we do is controversial, but it is also, I believe, a gift from God. And I don't look at myself as the embodiment of the gift. I look at myself as the custodian of the gift. All right. And, and, and it needs to be taken in perspective and it's tough. And, and, you know, it was hard enough for me being an attorney, leaving the practice of law and going like this. I can only imagine how difficult it must be for you as a priest to have these beautiful gifts and work in an organization that let's face it, all, most of the saints were psychics and mediums. It's just that in, in medieval France, if you went around saying, I see spirits, you all too often ended up burned at the stake like Joan of Arc, unless you're in the clergy, like St. Clair of Assisi, and then you get declared 800 years later as the patron saint of television. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's because St. Clair of Assisi, was well, she, she was um, an associate of St. Francis of Assisi. He's one of my favorites. And turn around Tony... Um, was also a, a, a member of the Franciscans. He was uh, St. Fran uh, St. Anthony of Padua and St. Francis of Assisi and St. Clair of Assisi all worked together. And St. Anthony could lecture in languages that he never knew. Now, we call this channeling, of course, because he was a very respected spiritual teacher and member of the clergy, he was given the gift of, of, of tongues of the Holy Spirit. St. Francis of Assisi, and we could spend the whole show just talking about him, in deep meditative states of prayer, he developed stigmata, mimicking the wounds of Jesus by bleeding from his hands, his feet, and from his side. So that's another form of channeling. And then St. Clair 
Um, St. Clair is fascinating because like the Holy Roman Emperor, basically a German emperor, but popes, um, kings, I believe even the um, Muslim sultan from, uh, from Sicily, North Africa, they would send people to confer with her. And she got so ill toward the end of her life that she could no longer go to mass. So she would pray for, to God to let her see what was happening in mass. And she would see it in real time. We now know Claire to be what is known as a remote viewer. And a remote viewer is someone that can extend their consciousness, their soul, to another location to see what's happening in real time, mm -hmm. which is why in 1958, Pope Pius XII declared her the patron saint of television, because television, like Claire, was receiving images broadcast from afar. So don't tell me, um, all of our fellow uh, members of faith, that the Vatican doesn't know what these abilities sure. are. And it's how you look at them and how they are used, which, um, which people need to take into account before you cast the first stone of judgment. Sure. The gift that I uh, have been given to do and, and use is, is helping people that come to me in the night and are traumatized and and. and at the point of their death, died of gunshots or car crashes or things that, that and their their consciousness just wasn't ready for the repose, like we say, rest in peace, or or imagine mm -hmm. people going on to adventures. Uh, they were just in no shape to do that. They needed some kind of medical care uh, in the afterlife, and I help uh, at the tail end of that. My partners and I do, but um, yeah. Anyway, it, I under I I. I did this for a long time without speaking of it publicly because I just felt like it would get in the way of other things that I was given to do. But late in life, you know, I just decided I think it's time. To <laughs> well, sure. For every time there is a season and this this is the time. You know, what did George Lewis, um, the great civil rights uh, activist, say? If not, if not now, then when? If not us, then who? And, you know, that was, he applied that, of course, to civil rights. I apply that to our spiritual gifts. And I always wonder, you know, why didn't I go public with this um, earlier than I did? Because it wasn't the time. Hmm. You know, we can spend our entire lives saying, and I hear people do this all the time. Oh, if only I had. Why did it take so long for this? Mm -hmm. Well, the point is, you're here now. Right. And as the great Islamic writer Omar Khayyam said, is be thankful for this moment, for this moment is your life. Uh, you know, right. because yeah, we don't live in the past. The future hasn't occurred yet. We live right here. Right. I'm very big on that. Uh, C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite writers. And and in the screw tape letters, he makes a big point of talking about uh, the important he's he's writing from the point of view of demons. And so it's all kind of, you know, uh, backwards, but he's trying, he's trying to coach a young apprentice demon into making sure your client never thinks about the present, keep him in the past, keep him in the future, just keep him off the present. You know, that's the moment. Yeah. Well, C.S. Lewis, um, I think he was a very good friend to um, J.R.R. Tolkien, yes. who yes. also was an Oxford Don, a linguistics genius, and J.R.R. Tolkien was a very devout Catholic. And if you look at the Lord of the Rings, um, there's so many Catholic, or rather, I don't want to just say Catholic, let's say spiritual and Christian themes. If you look at the Ring of Power, I remember I was counseling a, um, when I was practicing law, I was counseling this young man, he was about 20, 21 years old, and I, he'd been coming to me since he was about 15, always getting arrested for drugs, for alcohol, and I said, you ever seen Lord of the Rings? He goes, Yeah. And I said, Gollum sitting in the dark with the ring going, my precious. I go, what do you think the ring symbolizes? He goes, what do you mean? I said, it's addiction. It's complete self-centeredness. All of a sudden, this kid looks at me and I said, you ever think what happens to a 65-year-old heroin addict? I said, that's what Peter Jackson, that's where they got the idea to, to model the actual character of Gollum on a 65 year old heroin addict because doesn't love anyone but their addiction. There's no one in their life. They've, they've put the addiction, the self-centeredness ahead of everyone. 
And I said, and I've been doing this long enough. I can guarantee that unless you get your act together and stop this, that is your future. Let me tell you something. <laughs> the you know because if I sat there and just preach at him, but I knew that he liked Lord of the Rings and all that, and I put it in terms that he could understand, and then all of a sudden it was like, whoa, I never thought of that. I said, do you think J.R.R. Tolkien just made this stuff up? He was looking for for inspiration as C.S. Lewis was. Think about what you just said, Father Nathan, of writing about spirituality from the perspective of the demon. That's going to, because it, it, first off, that's going to intrigue people. They're going to want to write it because people always like, you know, it, it's like, why are there so many movies and novels about murders and bad guys? And why do people love The Sopranos? Why do people love Yellowstone? I mean, these aren't nice families. This isn't the Brady Bunch. These are, you know, the Yellowstone, the Sopranos, Animal Kingdom. People are drawn to the 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 the, the evil. Yet by by looking at it through the filter of the evil, you see how bad that really is. And so, in effect, you're creating the lesson that that do do not do what these people are doing. So, yeah. so here's where it leads. Yeah. Here's where it leads. Well, you and I have both had this this uh, lineage and lived experience of communication that I'd never run across the phrase interdimensional communication until I read your new book, the Afterlife Frequency. Did you coin that, or was is that out there in the in the research or it, what? It may have been out there, but I remember when I was working on the research, I said, "Well." We live in the material world dimension, and spirits are in the the afterlife frequency, the other side dimension, heaven, uh, nirvana, whatever whatever cultural term you wish to place on it. And so we're communicating from this dimension to the next. And and I realized, well, that's interdimensional communication. And so I I, I use the phrase I believe initially in in my book uh, Evidence of Eternity, but I went into it in much greater detail in the afterlife frequency, because that's what we're doing. We're communicating between two different dimensions. Here's, here's an easy way of looking at it. Well, there's nothing easy about, but, but let me, let me explain. Give it is, okay. One of the key concepts of my book, or one of the, the key concepts that I introduce is the term, the electromagnetic soul. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say electromagnetic soul. What does that mean? Well, every great spiritual teacher from the Hindus of ancient Egypt uh, through the ancient Egyptians, through uh, Zoroaster, Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, St. Francis. I mean, you take all the great spiritual teachers, the Native American spiritualists, they all say that the who and what we are is not the body, but it's the soul. And that pre-exists the body, comes into the body, moves on after the body dies. We know from the study of neuroscience, which is the study of the human brain, that the brain has an electromagnetic field. And, and we, we can measure this. I mean, it, it, it do EEGs on people. We know that the, the neural network in our body um, works on EM pulses. And we know from the laws of thermodynamics that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. So drawing upon all of that, I put it together and developed the term the electromagnetic soul to describe what we really are, which is pure consciousness that is eternal electromagnetic energy. And it's interesting because I was very honored at a conference called Helping Parents Heal when Dr. Gary Schwartz. He was describing his research, um, afterlife research, and all of a sudden he put a, a slide of my book up and he said electromagnetic soul. And he, he basically explained what I just did and, and gave me credit for it as well. And he says, and let's look at the word soul as the source of universal love. And, and so when people say, well, EMS, electromagnetic soul, sounds very technical. No, it isn't because our soul is this energy 
that is the source of universal love and that we are all energetically interconnected and ultimately connected to the divine power that, that many people, myself included, refer to as God. And so when you start looking at things, at, at faith through the, the 21st century terminology of, of physics, it begins to make, I think, more sense than just, well, believe what we tell you because the book of such and such in, in scripture says this. Well, why do they say this? And, and I mean, for example, Moses, the bush that burned yet did not burn. If you lived in the Bronze Age like Moses did, how would you describe an intense form of electromagnetic energy? In other words, the power of God. You would use the vernacular of the day. It appeared to be a bush that burned yet did not burn. Let's fast forward to the... Um, the book of Acts in the New Testament, the Pentecost. Okay, it's roughly 40 days or so after Jesus has ascended, and Mother Mary and the disciples are together, and the gift of the Holy Spirit descends upon them, and they see tongues of fire above their heads. Well, you probably see auras, of Father Nathan, and when you see the energy field, a light bulb has an aura. I mean, look at look behind me. You see the lamps, and they're yeah. glowing. Mm -hmm. All right, is an energy field okay uh, is is the uh, the glow of an energy field emitted by an energy source we have an electromagnetic energy field and so an aura is the energy that you see around a person and the different chakras which align with the set the seven chakras align with the seven endocrines in the body the one governing the pituitary gland tends to flicker so if you are in the Iron Age, and you were witnessing this phenomenon, you would explain it in the terminology that you understood, which would be tongues of fire. I mean, let's face it, we got Jesus's disciples and Mother Mary. There are some seriously spiritual people in that room, yeah. and they're seriously receiving a major dose of, 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 of God energy. So they're going to be seeing these very pronounced energetic phenomenon that they would be describing in the terms that they were familiar with. And when you look at um, the way in, in, in art, Egyptian art, um, Hindu art, Buddhist art, Christian art, halos, yes. <laughs> that's why after years, a lifetime of research, I developed the term the electromagnetic soul not to take away from the spiritual aspect of, 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 of who and what we are, but to explain it. Because I believe there is an explanation for everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yes, God works in mysterious ways, as do the laws of physics. And to me, one you know, cannot exist without the other. So, sure. so anyway, sure. that's the, the short uh, story on, on in, um, electromagnetic soul. Now, how that works with interdimensional communication, we live here in the material world. Everything's made of molecules, which in turn are made of atoms, which in turn are made of electrons, protons, and neutrons, which in turn are composed on the subatomic level of a particle known as quanta, which is pure electromagnetic energy. And for the benefit of our audience members who are physics-oriented, Technically, an electron is a quantum because it's one eighteen hundredth the size of a proton. So there we cover there. And from a subatomic level all the way up, everything vibrates at a different frequency. Ergo, this pen on the subatomic level is made of the same EM energy that I am. It just vibrates at a different frequency. So are the radio waves that this show is being broadcast on. So is the light of the sun, the surface of Mars, the rings of Saturn. All of these are electromagnetic energy. So while our electromagnetic soul is housed, not created by, but housed in the body, it's um, we're vibrating at a lower frequency. Spirits, the EMS, leaves there and then becomes part of the collective consciousness, goes to heaven, however you want to describe it, is on a higher frequency. So think of the other side, heaven, nirvana, whatever, as a, uh, FM radio, we're at AM 
radio and the two systems co coexist. But then when we communicate, we bring our frequency up, they bring theirs down, you get a frequency match, ergo interdimensional communication. Okay. And okay. we're all capable of it. Some of us are better at it than others, just like some of us are better tennis players. Some of us are better sure. um, musicians. I believe my voice was consecrated to the Lord a long time ago. Uh, that's part of why I joined the Order of Preachers, because preaching and the, and the spoken word is especially important to us. But when I'm when I'm in that modality, I'm I'm completely conscious. I'm co-conscious. It's just that somebody somebody is is borrowing my voice and my imagination, my con my um, my cognition, my vocabulary. But Mark, in the way that it works in in my experience, I don't know these people, and so the when the, when you first get together, there's about five minutes of uh, breaking the ice. You know, just a, a little bit of getting accustomed Getting to it. Yeah. And then when we and they all died violent deaths. So at some point, we're going to talk about a tender experience, a memory. And they've talked about it enough that they don't break down in tears anymore. And I don't really like them crying inside me. And they know that that's just kind of one of my rules. If you need to cry, do that before you come into me. Um, but but oftentimes when we move from that cordiality in the first five minutes into deeper content, they'll say, I need to pause for a moment and we need to connect better. And that sometimes yeah. they'll talk about screwing in a light bulb or something on a radio band or something. And then one of them said, your energy, your um, your consciousness is like a green sparkly river. Uh, and it moves up and down a little bit like a stock market curve. And he said, I, all I have to do is watch yours and then I have to make mine match it and we'll be able to go further. So... Well, it's interesting. You said your voice was consecrated. Everything you've described, what you do is frequency. Yes. Our voice is sound wave frequency. Right. Spirits are frequency. They are aligning with your frequency to make contact, not only with you, but with their loved ones here to seek peace and resolution. And see, that that's, that's why I, I entitled this book, The Afterlife Frequency, because that's what you're doing. You're communicating with the afterlife frequency and everything that we do is about frequency. Yes. Even the physics of just speaking and listening, you know, some uh, vocal cords, uh, air, breath, moving past them, moving across space on uh, radio, on, on sound waves that are invisible to us that we didn't even know existed until what, maybe about 170 years ago. I don't know when people discovered that there were like Marconi and all that. Uh, yeah. But then then it's then what you say goes inside your hearer. It goes inside their body and bounces off an eardrum. And then and then that turn that brings a signal to the brain that then has emotional or intellectual responses to things. It's all just right there in front of us. There's just so much mystery and wonder and physics uh and physics going on. And, and we're right because um Exactly. The the um, frequency of sound waves hits the eardrum, which vibrates. And so the sound wave energy now becomes mechanical energy. And that vibration triggers a stapes bone in the middle ear, um, which is mechanical energy to strike the eighth cranial nerve, which now triggers an electronic um, frequency impulse that goes into the brain. And then we have five different brainwave frequencies, gamma, alpha, theta, um, excuse me, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And so then that aligns with whatever brainwave frequency we're um, using at the time. And that gets converted into recognizable concepts based on our memories, feelings, and cultural associations. And so the more we begin to study this, yes, this is a gift from God, but there's a delivery system for how this happens. Well, and from on, on page one of the Bible, you've got God trying to bring stuff into existence with a spoken word. You know, let there be, God speaks in that first story about uh, some sort of chasm or, or a void or something and speaking into it. And I believe as a preacher, I never, I, I never just give a, t a speech. I ask the Holy Spirit, the breath of God, what do you want to say to the people? And I'll make myself available. Uh, 
I don't just stand up there as an orator. I, I always, I was taught first, ask God, what is God trying to say to me? Hear that first, and then plan a homily. But mostly and when I'm standing in that space, it's sacred space, and it's not me giving a talk. It's God speaking to his people with me being the best um, uh, mouthpiece or best uh, instrument that I can be. Yeah. Once again, frequency. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, I think that I think it's important for for this to be understood by people. Because I, I hear a lot of people say that, well, I don't believe in religion. I don't believe in in uh, uh, in God. I say, well, but but I'm spiritual, and yet they're never able to explain to me what that means. Yeah. Uh, I think that that uh, being spiritual means that you are sensitive to the the frequencies and the vibrations beyond our five physical senses of sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. So. I, I think that now that humanity has the benefit of quantum physics, and and I'm not saying that we have all the answers yet, but we're at a point now where we're beginning to understand this and beginning to quantify and explain these things. Um, just here in, in 2022, there have been two very amazing developments in um, February of 2022 in Tartu, Estonia, there was a man in his 80s and he suffered a stroke. So he was rushed to a hospital. Uh, he was hooked up on an EEG, an electroencephalogram. And um, he had a massive heart attack and then died. And all five brainwave frequencies massively spiked at the time of death. And this had never happened before, or rather, nobody had died during an EEG before. Uh. And th the scientists analyzing it say this could be evidence of a near-death experience or possibly of, um, an, of a soul. And I spoke about this at the International Association for Near-Death Studies, that this could be evidence of my electromagnetic soul theory. Because at the point of death, all of a sudden there's a huge electronic spike because the soul is leaving. And then just on November 6th of 2022, uh, the Grossman uh, Center at the New York University issued a study called Lucid Dying. And over almost 600 people at 25 hospitals uh, in the U.S. and the U.K., people that went into uh, cardio uh, cardiopulmonary failure were being given CPR, they were um, uh, hooked up to EEGs and they found the same evidence that their brainwaves spiked. But in all these cases, they were able to resuscitate the people. And one in five of the people who had these, um, had this happen to them, came back with accounts of going into the light, encountering deceased loved ones, veridical perception, mm -hmm. hearing like what family members were saying on the other side of the hospital uh, in vivid detail. And the the uh, Sam Parnia, the lead scientist of the study said, of course, we're going to be doing more study, but unlike other body systems, which completely cease at physical death, these people died and came back maintaining their sense of self and their ability to perceive and interact. They said that this is scientific evidence that consciousness survives physical death. So we live in a very exciting time. Like, you know, people of faith have always known the soul lives on, but now we're going to be able to prove it. Well, I'm happy to be along for the ride. I'm, I've been hoping for the longest time that I would eventually intersect with researchers. Uh, you seem to know a lot about Franciscans. Do you know Domin D Dominicans very well? Um, I study faith, but I went to a Catholic school where the nuns and priests were Dominicans. All right. Well, Dominic founded us in, in uh, 1216. He founded the, the nuns in 1206, the friars in 1216. But you're, you're Oxford educated and and... We were there when Oxford was being created. Uh, Oxford University of Paris, University of Bologna were first the three of the first universities ever anywhere. And uh, we were there from the beginning because Dominic wanted us to be well-educated. 
And that meant he wanted us to be in the marketplace of ideas. He didn't just want yes. to send us to some, you know, Bible college or something, some place where we would get an indoctrination into a, a system. He wanted us to be in the tussle. Uh, and then St. Thomas Aquinas, who's one of our bright lights, he, uh, you, you know, Aquinas, uh, well, he was, you know, he, he was schooled in Aristotle and yeah. Aristotle had been lost during the um, the Dark Ages and was uh, his writings were kept alive in uh, in Spain when when the uh, Muslims, the Moors uh, had right. brought those libraries and stuff. So he in his day, Aquinas, Aquinas would be your friend. He's a, he was a researcher. Uh, somebody exploring things, some of which were maybe considered uh, because Aristotle was pre-Christian. He was thought of as pagan in some circles. Right. So that automatically bad. And Thomas just wouldn't have that. He just said, truth is, is our, our, you know, veritas is our motto. And that truth is to be found wherever uh, someone comes upon it. And and so anyway, I'm I'm excited to be part of this uh, way of looking at, th especially through quantum physics, at how does this happen? Uh, yeah, exactly. How does this happen? You know, because people think that, you know, as a medium, oh, first off, they think um, charlatanism or it's magic or hocus pocus, whatever. The thing is, um, look, I wasn't going to leave a lucrative practice of law to just go around saying, I see dead people. Um, it, it was a calling for me. And and it was a a very intense form of my life. I mean, this had always been with me, but what happened was I was very close to my parents. We always got along great. Okay, we were a very loving family. And the day before my mom passed, I was at my law office, and it was about five miles away from where my my parents lived. And I get a call from my mom. And it's funny because I was thinking about spaghetti. Now I'm Italian, so thinking about spaghetti is not thing. <laughs> but I was really thinking about spaghetti. And the phone rings, and I answer, and it's mom. You know, and my secretary puts her through. She goes, your mom's on the phone. I go, hey, mom, what's up? She goes, honey, I made spaghetti for lunch. Why don't you come over? I go, okay. And, and uh, Father Nathan, I had the most amazing time. Um, mom looked tired that day. Dad, you know, dad and, and mom and I, we talked, we laughed. And just as I was getting ready to leave, she said, Mark, we have three such great kids, and 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 I just want you to know how happy I am that you're my son. And she hugged me and kissed me, and I said, I love you, Mom. And I remember leaving and said something, I mean, it was beautiful, but something didn't feel right. And then the next morning, I was in court, and the judge's assistant came out and asked me to come into chambers they handed me the phone and my secretary was in tears and she said, your dad just called, your mom died. And I knew that she, now I know she wanted to say her goodbye to me. She knew that something wasn't right. And, and she died peacefully uh, from what's known as a ventricular fibrillation, which honestly, she, after the amount of suffering that she had in her life, she had terrible Crohn's disease, heart problems, diabetes, she had all these really difficult things that she was dealing with her whole life, she earned a peaceful passing. Well, I spiraled into the worst depression, and wow. but I still had to practice law. I was in court two days later. I was functioning. And and I remember driving back from court thinking, what, what good is this ability if it's not making me feel better? And all of a sudden, I felt one of those waves of grief come in. I go, let me stop driving. So I pull over to this convenience store parking lot and I'm sitting there father Nathan and all of a sudden this flash of light goes off in the car and I turn to the passenger uh, seat instinctively and I see my mother's silhouette in this beautiful silver white light and before I could even react to that her voice fills my head and she said Mark you've been given the gift of mediumship so that you would not be crushed by grief but now you must help those who are suffering with theirs all right, so I'm trying to process this. And then the next wave of messages hit me. She said, your life's mission is to help people understand that God exists, that heaven, the afterlife exists, that souls are immortal living beings, that humans can communicate with souls 
and that we will all be reunited when it is your time to leave the material world in the light that is God. So I sink back into the chair in my car and I'm soaking wet. And all I can say is, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I can't tell anybody this. They're going to think I'm insane. Except and now I'm you tell everybody that'll hear you. Yeah. And, and, and but then I um I, I got my composure back and let me tell you something I was here about these people say oh my spiritual experience it was very shy, you know it was like no look my my mom was from from North Jersey this was a fire hose to the face this was not some I was on a mountaintop in Maui you know uh, smoking weed no this 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 was a very very direct message. And everything from that point in my life changed. Um, I started working on on uh, taking notes because I started feeling it, it's my abilities intensified. Within um, a few months, I'd been offered a job at a government agency, so I, I could transfer out of running a law firm. And then a few months after that, my I wrote my first book. And then it came out, never letting go. And I brought uh, my manager, Rocky, on board. And she got me on a speaking tour first of New York City. And she got me on MSNBC, which was great. And then to Harvard University. So we're at Harvard. And it's a few few weeks before Christmas. I remember it was a freezing but beautiful Massachusetts morning. And we're drinking coffee. And I'm excited about what I got coming up. And also my cell phone rings. And it's my boss, the elected official. He said, I'm receiving too much flack from a particular political party. I'm sure everyone can guess which one that I have a psychic on staff and uh, that you're taking too much time off of work. And, 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 and he's going on and on. And I said, well, I'm taking my vacation time. And as an attorney, my beliefs, I have an absolute First Amendment right to my spiritual beliefs. But let me make this easy for you. He goes, and how's that? I go, please consider this my resignation. He goes, okay. And I sense the relief in his voice, and I hung up the phone. And then I said, oh, my God, Rocky, I just quit the practice of law. And she said, Mark, take a look around. Where are you? Harvard. And what are you doing in an hour? Well, giving a lecture on the afterlife and signing copies of my book, Never Letting Go. She said, don't you think you're supposed to be right here, right now? And you know, Father Nathan, I have never looked back. Good for you. Um, yeah, life, the time is when the time is supposed to be. Uh, I, we were talking earlier about Omar Khayyam, um, the, the Muslim philosopher who said that, give thanks for today, for today is your life. It's not the past. It's not the future. It's right here, right now. And I realized that everything in my life had led up to that point. And I look at what I do. This is my ministry. This is my work. And unconventional, though it may be, it's to help people understand exactly what my mother's spirit, speaking on behalf of the collective, said to help people understand God exists, that heaven exists, that our souls are immortal living spirits, that we can communicate with souls, and we'll, we will be reunited with our loved ones when it is our time to leave this world. Okay. And... I consider it an honor. Uh, it's very humbling. And and uh, all I can say is I, I thank God every day for, for entrusting me with this ability. Um, but I also tend to think of what Mother Teresa said um, when she said that God never gives me more than I can handle. I just wish God didn't trust me so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I get that. Yeah. I have a mom story. My, my mom, I was the only one of the five of us that wasn't present at her death. I was in, living in Arizona. I'd visited enough and I'd, I'd been around enough deathbeds to know uh, not to make it all about the final moment. Uh, but but anyway, my my siblings, we had just moved her into, um, into a care center across from where she had lived for 10 years. 
And um, they told me that they were all gathered and that they knew that she would die in the next day or two. Uh, and they had, uh, they were going to, the people were going to clean her or change her or something that, you know, they just said, okay, well, we'll, we'll go out and have a little lunch and come back. They went out to a Mexican restaurant where the, the music was blaring so loud that they asked, would you please turn it down? We'd like to be able to talk. And they had to do with that twice. And then as my sister got a call from the center saying mom had died over the, at this Mexican restaurant, it was just playing Mexican music was um, uh, Summer Over the Rainbow. That, you know, that that recording of Summer Over the Rainbow that uh, that morphs into What a Wonderful World, the uh, Louis Armstrong recording. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, you can see over my shoulder, my first book, the only one that she was alive when I wrote was uh, on The Wizard of Oz. She knew of my love for that. And, you know, uh, they were they were going, wow, look at that. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue, clouds of white, <laughs> all of that. Oh, yeah. You know, in in um, it's so funny you said that because we played um, over the rainbow at my mother's uh, service. It was one of the songs we played. And when you read the lyrics to that, it there's such great metaphorical significance. You know, over the rainbow, to me, appears to be a metaphor for going to the afterlife. And, right. you know, maybe, you know, maybe in Hollywood in the 30s when they were filming the movie, that wasn't the intent. But you can create a work of art and it can be interpreted in, in many different ways. Well, in my childhood, it, it always aired when there were only three channels on TV. They only always aired it during the Passover Easter cycle, uh, when people were already thinking of uh, coming full circle, death and new life, all of that. Yep. Yeah. Well, I could talk forever to you, and I hope we have many future conversations. But as we wrap this show, is there something you haven't said that you want to say? Well, um, I'd like to talk about my book, The Afterlife Frequency, mm -hmm. and uh, the subtitle is The Scientific Proof of Spiritual Contact and How That Awareness Will Change Your Life. And I wrote this to explain all the uh, a scientific basis for all the different forms of spirit contact, not just through a medium, but for those of you out there who maybe had a dream where a loved one comes and talks with you or you feel somebody in your um, around you, or you see them in your peripheral vision, if you've had a near-death experience or a shared death experience, or at the bedside of someone transitioning and you feel spirits around, around you, perhaps you've seen someone have a deathbed vision where they begin to talk to or interact to spirits connected with them before yeah. they die. And I explain how all these phenomenon are connected how the electromagnetic soul theory explains all of them. Also, I introduced my raft technique, how to recognize signs from spirits, accept it as real, feel it without fear and trust in the message. We may not all be mediums, but we are all capable of receiving messages from spirits and the yeah. raft technique will help you do that. And so my book is, is the ideal present for yourself if you're coping with loss or someone you know that you don't know what to give them when someone they love has died this this is is the book and uh support of your book you 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 do a nice job of doing the um the explanation around quantum physics and all of that without making our eyes roll back uh it it you know you're oxford educated and you're 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 very eloquent but I just want my listeners to know that this is a um, a book that you, that uh, don't let yourself talk yourself into not reading it because it would be beyond you. I don't I don't think that's true at all. I think it's very um, uh, your your writing style is very clear, and uh, I thought it was a great read. Thank you. Uh, I do, I want my audience to know. I starting this call was all kind of trouble. We <laughs> we had all kind of technical everything and. Mark, my guest, is walking me through, just do it this way or try that. He was giving me all kind of tips on how to be a podcaster, and you know, you're a very kind guy. I appreciate it. Well, let me tell you, you know, it, it's we talk about miracles. I mean, try explaining what we're doing on a podcast to somebody in the year 1895. You do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I, I'm learning a day at a time, and you, you, you packed a lot of learning into this one little uh, uh, interview today, so I appreciate that.
the work that Father Nathan is doing is so important. I was privileged to meet him at the International Association for Near Death Studies Conference in, in Salt Lake City. And he has a very difficult mission in life. And that doesn't matter to him. What matters is getting through to all of you, touching your hearts, your minds, and your spirits. So thank you, Father Nick. Great to have you here. Mark Anthony J.D., the Psychic Explorer, also known as the Psychic Lawyer. God bless you and have a great day. Bye now. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Joyful Friar. You can visit me at nathan-castle.com. Send me a message by clicking the contact button. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can make a donation by clicking the donate button. See you next time. God bless.